The Pan-Alaska Association's mission is to serve as an umbrella organization for Japan-Alaska organizations to promote friendship between our two nations and to create opportunities to share, preserve, and celebrate Japanese traditions with anyone interested in Japanese culture. We hope that you will choose to join our efforts to strengthen our community through personal and cultural connections. So what's a kotatsu? No, it's not a cat. Japanese of my grandmother's generation cooked meals, shared stories while eating mandarins, and created memories at the cooking hearth known as the irori. The kotatsu is a modern version of the irori, and now is found in most Japanese households in the form of a wooden table with a heat source. This piece of furniture is often the only source of heat and the central gathering place for Japanese families. The Japan Alaska Association needs your help to draw not just those of Japanese heritage, but all members of our community who have an appreciation for Japanese culture. These events will serve as an opportunity to create unity within the Japanese community in Anchorage and beyond. Today, we have a collaboration between this beautiful center, the Montgomery Dixon Japan Center, uh, and also uh, the Japan Alaska Association, and also the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, and it's definitely a time where we all need to um, coalesce and come together, learn more how we can work to, with one another. Uh, so this is why today we're honored to have uh, Ms. Margaret Stock with us. All right, so Margaret, uh, we very much um, are happy to have you with us today. If you could perhaps um, tell us a little bit about your background. Absolutely. I'm very pleased to be here and excited to see you all. And I'm particularly excited because I have some background in Japan. Uh, but I should start with the, the basics. So I, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. I've lived in Alaska for about 30 years. I got to Alaska with the Army. The joke is the Army called me up and they I was volunteering for active duty for three years and they said that because I had volunteered they would give me my choice of assignment. I said, what are my choices? And they said, Panama, Korea, or Alaska. Okay. And I picked Alaska. <clears throat> so I got up here in 1986 as an Army lieutenant and I spent three years, approximately three years on active duty, a little bit less than that because I got into graduate school and they released mm -hmm. me early. Uh, but after I got released from active duty in Alaska, I was actually assigned to Japan as a reserve officer. So I maintained my residence in Alaska, and I was going to graduate school, I went to law school, uh, and I lived in Alaska most of the time, but then I would get deployed to Japan on a regular basis. So I was a security officer for United States Forces Japan for many years, and then I was a deputy provost marshal for United States Forces Japan. For several years. Whereabouts in uh, Japan? Oh, well, I was assigned to Yokota Air Base, but I got to travel all around Japan. I had a wonderful time. My boss forced me to learn Japanese, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which I found to be a beautiful language. I very much enjoyed it. I had wonderful adventures. I got to climb Fujisan one, one year, which I thought was you know, a pretty big deal. Uh, I traveled all over the country, um, literally pretty much everywhere. The only place I didn't go, I think, was Okinawa. Mm -hmm. which was ironic because U.S. Forces Japan had lots of yeah. troops in Okinawa, but they never happened to send me there. But I went to Hokkaido, and I went to um, Sendai, and um, Shikoku, and basically all over the place. Um, had a really good time, great duty assignment, grew to love Japan, Japanese food, the Japanese people. I studied Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up coming back to Alaska, taking basic Japanese classes here at the university. And I hosted a couple of Japanese exchanges. Uh, most recently, last year, I had a high school student mm -hmm. um, from Japan who went to service high school for the year and then stayed at our house. Oh, great. And her sister came and worked on my Senate campaign. I ran for the United States Senate last year, and mm -hmm. the older sister of my exchange student was a political science student in Japan. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to study an American political campaign, so she came over and oh. was like an intern with my uh, yes. political campaign, had a really good time. Great. So, I have some ties to Japan. Yes. Have you had the opportunity, Margaret, to um, visit Japan since? You, you left those years ago with the, with the military? I haven't been there for probably about six years. Mm -hmm. And I would love to go back and affect the family that I hosted their daughter. They really much would like 
they would love us to come, my family to come and visit. Great. My daughter's studying Japanese too in college, so oh, I've been good. over a couple times. Okay. So we're trying to practice a little bit of Japanese at home, but it's uh, uh, You've got, got lots of great ties to Japan. That's really nice to hear that. Yeah, it did. Um, I don't know if um, all of us knew that, so that's great. Uh, Margaret, a, a bit of a broad question, but um, maybe just to kind of kick things off, um, if you could um, tell us what are your thoughts of uh, the current state of Alaska and the nation, whether it's um, economic, whether it's with um, immigration, maybe tie it all up into one there. But. Well, I think we're facing some tough times uh, economically, of course, and with the uh, price of oil having fallen, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing job losses. I'm an immigration lawyer in Anchorage, and I'm extremely busy, but surprisingly, a fair number of folks are leaving the state, which, yeah. of course, is not a good sign. You know, we'd rather have people coming into the state to mm -hmm. do business rather than people departing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen a fair amount of that. Um, I think, you know, economically we're just facing some tough times right now with the budget cuts planned at the federal level. Those are going to impact Alaska. Uh, They're talking at the federal level about taking away a lot of money that Alaskans have depended on. Mm -hmm. And cuts to federal agencies impact everybody here in Alaska. You know, um, as your time as an immigration lawyer um, here in Anchorage, um, has, do you feel, has there ever been a time quite like this? No, um, there hasn't been. An, uh, it's an odd time because I'm extremely busy, but it's not busy in a positive way. Mm -hmm. It's not people coming and saying we'd like an investor visa. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd mm -hmm. like to hire more workers. We, you know, we have that shortage of workers and that sort of thing. It's more people are afraid, mm -hmm. and so we're seeing a lot more people applying for citizenship because right. they're concerned that they might be deported if they don't get their citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm also seeing a lot of people having trouble with the immigration system because of tightening of the rules, because the rules have gotten so complicated. Mm -hmm. It used to be relatively easy for people to apply for citizenship, mm -hmm. and most people who applied would get it. But there's been a bit of a change in the agency, and now the agency that processes immigration petitions looks at the citizenship application process as a chance to decide that they shouldn't have given you a green card in the first place, okay. and they should <coughs> deport you now, and the forms have gotten longer and more difficult and they're more likely to deny applications. The denial rates are much higher than now than they were historically. And Margaret, I, I know it's going to very much differ from applicant to applicant and perhaps even um, depending on what country the applicants come from, but could you walk us through what, what's the typical general process that somebody has to go through to, to get to citizenship, to, to whether it's a successful application or not? I mean, what's involved? Well, it's, it's complicated, and so 99% of people applying for citizenship mm -hmm. have a green card. Okay. And you have to have the green card or the permanent residence for the most part before you can apply for citizenship. There's some exceptions. The big exception are people in the military. Okay. They don't have to have a green card before they apply for citizenship. Mm -hmm. But most people have to get a green card, and the green card process is very, very, very difficult. Um, most people in Alaska are probably unaware of the fact that we have uh, thousands of immigrants living in Alaska who are perfectly legal, mm -hmm. but they can't get a green card. Okay. They don't have a green card, they're not eligible for a green card, and so they're not eligible for citizenship. Yep. Uh, when, when the permanent fund debate came up recently, they're talking about automatically registering people to vote mm -hmm. if they apply for the Alaska Permanent Fund. Some of the politicians who were pushing the idea of automatic voter registration were saying, well, there's all these people that don't register to vote. And I looked at the percentages and I said, well, a lot of them aren't registering to vote because they're not citizens. And I don't think the politicians were aware of the large percentage of people in our population who are legal, they're perfectly legally resident in Alaska, but they don't have green cards and they can't become citizens. So for those that are not in, in, with an active green card, uh, they, they may very well be on, on, on a very short-term visa that they would be looking to perhaps get renewed? They could be on a short-term visa, but surprisingly, a lot of them are business owners. Okay. So for example, we have Japanese living in Alaska who are on an e-visa. It's a treaty trader, treaty investor visa, and as long as they own their business, okay. they can live in Alaska and continue to run the business, but they can't ever get a green card and mm -hmm. they can't get citizenship mm -hmm. unless they qualify for it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of foreign students at the University of Alaska who mm -hmm. go to school here for three, four, five, six years, mm -hmm. some go into master's degrees or get PhDs, and they can't get a green card, mm -hmm. but they're here legally for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. We have people who apply for asylum. We have people from Central America who have temporary protected status. 
we have um, folks in, on diplomatic visas. Uh, we have professional workers for oil companies. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I got a green card approved for an athlete who was here on an O visa for a very mm -hmm. long time. Uh, o is for outstanding athletes. Okay. We have people mushing in the Iditarod who are on P visas. Uh, there's more than 80 different non-immigrant visas and thousands of people living in Alaska who have non-immigrant visas, but they don't have green cards. What are you seeing, Margaret, on, I believe it's called, is it called the J-1 visa? The yeah, hotel yeah, industry, one. the fishing right. industry in particular, has relied on those in the past. Um, I think it's been in our local news that that's been cut back a little bit. Well, there's never been a quota for the J visas, but okay. it, the J visa is a category that lots of people use. And the high school student I mentioned that I mm -hmm. posted was on a J visa. Okay. So it's a, a visa that's used for exchange visitors. The university uses it for professors. Mm -hmm. There are students attending the university mm -hmm. on J visas. Mm -hmm. But the program became a little bit controversial in Alaska recently when a lot of um, folks started coming in for summer work travel. Mm -hmm. So you would be a college student, say, in Bulgaria, and you decide you want to see America. And mm -hmm. the State Department had an exchange program called Summer Work Travel, where you could come to America, you could work, and you could see America. And it was considered a cultural exchange visa, so you're supposed to work, but you're also supposed to have some cultural sure. activities and so forth. And there's no quota for these visas. Mm -hmm. So, of course, a lot of young people attending college in foreign countries want to spend the summer mm -hmm. in America. It sounds pretty exciting. And mm -hmm. if you're a college student, you probably don't have a lot of money yeah. or princess cruises or something. but. If you can work your way through the summer, that sounds pretty attractive to a lot of people. So we've had a large number of students coming from all over the world on summer work travel. Mm -hmm. And I think the news stories mainly focused on folks from Eastern Europe, but we've also had Chinese folks, Filipinos, mm -hmm. um, Japanese people coming in on, for the summer for what they call summer work travel, which is just a small part of the State Department's J program. So I can, it sounds like I, I may be able to assume that, um, well, the, the cultural component is very much part of the purpose of that. It, it's it's probably been perhaps either misused or, or not. Uh, a lot of the students may not have always been able to fulfill all the goals that the, the program was meant to achieve for them. Well, the program does require a cultural exchange. Right. So the students who come over on a J are supposed to have a chance to see Alaska, maybe mm -hmm. go on some tours. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to just work, work, work all the time yeah. and not get any time for exchange. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we haven't had too much trouble in Alaska, mm -hmm. but there was a company in Pennsylvania, you might have heard of them, Hershey Chocolate Company. Mm -hmm. um, they got in big trouble for hosting lots of J1s, and they put them in an isolated community in the middle of Pennsylvania. It's basically like a chocolate factory, mm -hmm. and the students were upset because they weren't getting much of a cultural exchange. Yep. Um, they weren't seeing anything anything probably, in yeah. America, yep. and so there was a Quite an uproar over that and then after um, that incident happened it was during the time when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State she mm -hmm. barred certain types of operations from hosting J-1s ah, including um, fish factories mm -hmm. uh, and so the Alaska fishing industry was barred from using J-1 students for the most part but they could still come in to work for hotels or work for lodges mm -hmm. okay. or work for tourism industries that sort of thing. When, when there being no uh, quota in, in the past, it, so is it? It's just a bit unpredictable what um, what business owners can expect as far as um, being able to have applicants come over. I mean, well, it's it's one of the, it's a type of program where there's program sponsors, and so if you're a business owner and you're you're thinking about hosting a J one, you're supposed to approach one of the program sponsors okay. and say, "I'm a business owner. I'd like to have a J one student. Can you find me a J one student?" Mm -hmm. And then they would mm -hmm. the J one students would apply to the program sponsor. For okay. Them permission to come to Alaska. So I knew a young lady from Turkmenistan who did this, and she applied to come to McCarthy in the middle of Wrangell St. Elias National yep. Park to work mm -hmm. at one of the lodges mm -hmm. in McCarthy, and she had a great time. Right. Um, her job was to you know, clean at the lodge mm -hmm. and help the guests and that sort of thing, but she also got time to go on a glacier trip, and yep. she met a lot of people. Oh, sure. She had a wonderful time, and then she went back to Turkmenistan to go back to college. Okay, great. You know, we've... Um, kind of segue into the next part of our questions here. So we've had a, a new administration um, since January. It's been um, quite the ride in the, in the first hundred some odd days. Um, in this short time, I, I know that there's been um, some, some fear and some controversy within even our Alaskan residents about 
uh, like you said, um, can they stay, can they not? Um, what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to us? Can you just talk to us a little bit about um, what you're feeling and what you're, what you're seeing, what you're sensing from our local residents here about the National Administration and about um, immigration in general and um, the, the kind of fear you were talking to us about a few minutes ago? Uh, well, things, uh, laws that were previously probably not being enforced to the hilt are now being enforced, and I'm starting to see that in Alaska. So, for example, there's a law in the books that says if you're a green card holder, you're required to carry your green card with you at all times, mm -hmm. and it's a federal misdemeanor not to carry your card with you at all times. That was a law that, although it's been on the books for 50 years, was never rigorously enforced. Right. You know, so if you were a green card holder and you just didn't, you know, left your card at home locked up yeah. in a safe or something, you could walk around town and nobody would bother you. But, sure. Um, now we're starting to see federal agents asking people for green cards, and if they don't have it, then they charge them with a federal misdemeanor. Okay. And that's starting to happen. And so that's something I'm seeing that, you know, I have to warn people about these laws that previously weren't being enforced. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot tougher approach to immigrants who violate the law mm -hmm. uh, and the immigration laws are actually very very tough so if you enforce them to the hilt you cause a lot of pain to a lot of families um, and I can just give you some examples I just helped a couple from the military base and the husband uh, has been in the military and his wife came over perfectly legal from a European country mm -hmm. but she only had permission to be here for 90 days and he didn't he was deployed and busy, mm -hmm. and he didn't get the paperwork filed <coughs> on time. Ninety you know, days comes up. Ninety days comes and goes, and he's thinking, "Oh, I'm in the military; they're not going to do anything to my wife." Well, now they are. They're rounding people up and saying, "You know, you didn't get your papers filed in time. Tough. You know, we're going to you know, jail you and ship you out to Seattle to be in a detention center, and then you're going to be deported." And the previous administration would generally have a little more mercy on people, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, people that were related to military members, or if there was a special circumstance or the person had children or something, they would take that into account. But now they're just saying, no, you know, we're going to be pretty tough with these folks. And everybody needs to follow the law exactly and not break any laws. And it's hard to comply with the law. That's yeah. part of the problem. So well, in regards to green card holders, for example, because we know, we know there are just so many, not just Alaska, but throughout the country. Right. Um, Knowing that they're not citizens, if, if they were to commit a misdemeanor or even a felony and, and perhaps be found guilty, uh, does that automatically call for uh, deportation, or is or is there some room there to? Um, well, there's them? still a little bit of room there. But yeah. To give you an example, it's a crime not to carry a green card. Okay, it's a okay. misdemeanor. Um, but if you got charged with that crime and you pled guilty, you know, it's 30 days in jail and a dollar fine or whatever. Um, the likelihood that a green card holder would be deported for that is not so high because most people, if they got charged with being deportable because they did something like that, they would get to go in front of the judge and the judge would allow them to apply for relief from being deported. And with a relatively small offense like that, that's not considered a crime of moral turpitude mm -hmm. or a drug-related offense or something, they might the judge might grant them relief from deportation. So they might not actually get deported, but okay. they have to hire a lawyer, sure. defend themselves. Um, one thing people don't realize is the immigration courts right now are completely overwhelmed. Um, okay. They have a huge backlog, hundreds and hun hundreds of thousands of cases backlogged. Alaska used to be within the jurisdiction of the Portland. Oregon mm -hmm. Immigration Court until about a week ago when Seattle took over jurisdiction of the, the Alaska cases. And our system right now is in a little bit of chaos because the judges ride circuit to Alaska. The backlog in the courts is so great that most people aren't getting a hearing for years and years and wow. years. So you can be charged with being deportable and you have to show up for your court hearing, but you're not going to get a court hearing for you know, you'll show up for one little hearing. Judge will say, "Well, I need to schedule your hearing for 2018." And just, they're just literally in limbo yeah, until right, they right. until that time comes. Do the judges actually come here? They come here. Well, they also appear on video uh, okay. for some hearings, but they're supposed to come up here once or twice a year, and they're completely backlogged. Wow. Um, the asylum system is also really backlogged. We've had lots of people applying for asylum because there's no other option for them. So recently, when uh, President Trump issued his executive order. A whole bunch of oil company people in Alaska were forced to apply for asylum because he was going to 
cancel all their worker visas mm-hmm. because they happen to be born in Libya or some other country that yeah. you know they happen to be born in, but they hadn't been back there for years, and mm-hmm. you know they were oil company tech workers or oil mm-hmm. company executives, so they had to go apply for asylum because that's the only thing they could apply for since he was canceling their yeah. worker visas, you know. Um, so you know that's going on. I don't think people realize the courts are completely backlogged. Um, the agency's getting tougher, so more people are getting. Put in front of the judge um, because the agency won't grant their case and then they refer them to the immigration judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of errors by the agency and this means more and more people have to hire immigration attorneys to straighten out messes. Okay. Um, I had a case recently in Alaska where somebody came to me and they had this scary letter from the immigration agency mm-hmm. and it said, you applied for citizenship, we're denying your citizenship case. We think we made a mistake in 2007 when we gave you your green card. Wow. And we yeah. think you're now illegally here because we made a mistake and gave you a green card. And, you know, we, we can't take it away from you, but you're illegally here and you need to leave the country immediately. You're an illegal immigrant, basically, they told me. Mm-hmm. We got this letter. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, she came in to see me. and She'd been living in Alaska for years and thought she had a green card. And I said, where's your green card? She pulls it out of her wallet. She's got one. And she got this letter from the immigration agency saying that they messed up and they made a mistake and they never should have given her a green card. So, you know, I looked at it and I researched the law and I said, your green card is perfectly legal. I think they don't understand the law. And so I wrote the agency back and I explained to them that it was perfectly legal for them to have given her a green card and there wasn't anything wrong. And, yeah. and I said, um, you know, given the letter you wrote her telling her she's illegally here and you're gonna, you want her to leave, you know, I'm going to have to file a lawsuit if you don't rescind your letter. Yeah. And so they got my letter and they immediately read it and they said, oh, we're sorry, we didn't understand the law, we need to retrain our officers. Misunderstanding. Uh, misunderstanding, <laughs> and oh, by the way, she can go to her citizenship, at her um, citizenship ceremony in a week. You know, and then, so they basically rescinded the whole decision they had made saying she was not eligible for citizenship and they retracted their statement that they had wrongly given her a green card and she's a citizen now. But if she hadn't had an attorney to figure that out and confront the agency and threaten to sue the agency, yeah. you know. I'm sure. There, there, you know, yeah, they made out of that letter, letter, right? You know, that said, we made a mistake, we never should have given you a green card. That's uh, unbelievable. So yeah. this is all kind of bubbling up now. It's happening mm-hmm. to a lot of people. A lot of people are getting hassled at the border now, more mm-hmm. than they used to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A big thing that I warn everybody, even American citizens, about now is they're starting to take away everybody's electronic devices at the border for random searches. And they give you a piece of paper and it says your device has been retained for a random search. So your laptop, your iPad, your iPhone is being kept by the federal government and they're going to search it. And they literally take it away from you and they give you this receipt and they say, you know, we'll either mail it back to you or you can come get it in a couple of weeks. Um, and at, the, at the border crossing. At the border, at the border crossing, border. Right, right. right. And they literally are making copies of everything on your phone to look at it to see if they can go on a fishing expedition and find something you know criminal or yeah. and of course this is all being pitched as a national security thing okay. apparently people are lots of people out there probably have um, information that's going to hurt our national security mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in their electronic devices so the government wants to search everything randomly and catch some people so the idea, Margaret, that it, it, it's 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 truly supposed to be random. It, it could be whether it can be you or I in line. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're necessarily a green card holder or a, a U.S. passport uh, holder. It or doesn't matter. No, um, there I mean, there are some people that suspect that they're using not random criteria to seize people's devices. Mm-hmm. But you know, they literally. I can, if anyone's curious, I can email you a copy of the notice Customs and Border Protection gives people. It basically says your device has been seized, and we're going to make a copy of it, and we'll get it back to you. But this terrifies people. I mean, your whole life is on your iPod mm-hmm. or your phone, mm-hmm. and for the government to just grab all that stuff seems yeah. incredibly invasive to people. Yeah. Um, all your friends, your contacts, your telephone numbers, you know, and who knows, maybe you have something on there that you didn't know. You know, people yeah. are often hard to find. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows who you, you might have talked to somebody that turns out to be a bad guy. And right, you weren't aware of it. And and, right. Yeah, so um, people are really nervous about that sort of thing. In fact, lawyers are now telling people don't cross the border with electronic devices. Uh, leave the phone at home. Leave the phone at home. Yeah, leave the phone at home. Leave the computer at home. You know, um, use a scrubber. You know, throw away phones. Yeah, <laughs> things have just been very Save different. Yourself yeah. in trouble. Right, you know? right, and avoid yeah, the hassle right. to begin with. Right, so that kind of thing's going on too. Um, 
but anyway, back to your original question. Mm -hmm. The way to get citizenship is you get a green card first, and then you apply. But they will now scrutinize your whole entire history to go back and look and see whether they should have given you a green card in the first place. Okay. So if there's anything at all in your background that you're concerned about, you know, you might want to go talk to somebody. And yeah, try to get ahead of that. Get ahead of that, yeah. What, what would be a typical um, time frame or range to apply and, and to be um, accepted or just even receive a decision? Uh, well, most people, the processing is fairly quick after you apply. It usually takes about four to six months in Anchorage if you're fully qualified for citizenship. And most people have to have had a green card for either five years is a typical waiting period, or three years if they're married to and living with an American citizen. Okay. The theory there being that the American citizen is going to teach you all about the principles of American government. Yes. <laughs> I know. That's so they're going to shave off two years of waiting period. Um, but you can, and if you're in the military, you can naturalize without any waiting period at all. Okay. Uh, and then there's also expedited citizenship for people who are married to American citizens who are going overseas. So, an American citizen who's going on a mission, say they're a missionary and they're going to be going overseas with their uh, foreign spouse, the foreign spouse can apply for expedited American citizenship. Uh, we've had a lot of oil company people that marry um, foreigners. And mm -hmm. Same thing if they're mm -hmm. if you're an employee of you know Conical Phillips and you're yeah, going to Louisiana, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. you know for a year you can get expedited citizenship for your spouse. Uh, we also have a law now that's having a lot of children. It's been the law since 2000. It's called the Child Citizenship Act, and it allows children to get immediate citizenship when their parents become American citizens. So a child who has a green card and whose mother or father naturalizes while the child is under 18 mm -hmm. becomes a citizen immediately, instantly. And there's no finding of any papers. It's <laughs> it's automatic, which actually causes yeah. a lot of confusion <laughs> because <laughs> do do those of you who with bureaucracies know that automatic doesn't, doesn't uh, mean the computer gets notified. Yeah. So when you automatically become an American citizen and you're seven or eight years old, the computer doesn't get updated. Mm -hmm. to show that you're a citizen mm -hmm. and until you go back later and pay them a lot of money and file a form right. and you know there's a very very expensive form that you can file to get the computer updated uh, wow. which has caused a lot of problems for people because you know if you, you're older and you think you're not you think you have a green card mm -hmm. you're actually a citizen but the computer shows you still have a green card uh, there can be some issues there Margaret, for the typical green card holder, let's say they, they choose to, to not apply for citizenship right away or at all, what, how, how long is their term normally um, before they need to apply for renewal, perhaps? Okay, well, most people who get a green card get, um, they call it a 10-year green card, mm -hmm. but it, it's actually permanent residence. So you're a green card holder forever, but you have to renew the card every 10 years. I see. So it's okay. kind of like renewing a passport or a driver's license. You know, the card will expire. Right. Um, in the old days, they would issue a green card and it would never expire. Oh, sure. But they ran into trouble when gentlemen, say your age, uh, would be asked for their green card and it would have a baby picture on it. And nobody could <laughs> tell. <laughs> nobody could tell. <laughs> hey, <it's> you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, you know, they started saying, well, we should get the a picture replaced every 10 years. So, okay. there is a requirement that they got to get your picture. Yeah, didn't get it updated. You a little bit. updated. Yeah, but you don't, you don't lose your. Your resident status, you don't have to like reapply to be a resident again. You just have to get another. Okay, yeah. so fairly routine. Fairly routine. But, um, right. See the point of that. Um, you know, a, a lot of our membership and, and the people tied with JACL and, and JAA um, have a particular interest in um, the history of uh, Japanese American incarceration. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, as citizens and residents uh, uh, residents of Alaska, and the United States? What can we do? Um, to, to advocate for our rights, to, to help, to, to educate others, to, um, and, and ourselves, and to protect ourselves. Well, there are lots of things you can do. First thing to do is read the news and educate yourself about what's happening. Also, be aware that a lot of what public officials say right now is not accurate. Uh, and that's a little disturbing, I think, because in the past we were sort of used to public officials being really careful to say things that were correct, and if they weren't correct, they would correct them immediately and apologize to everyone. But now we've sort of entered an era where many public officials are saying things that are just not true. And it's hard to, you know, the news media doesn't pin them down, you know, if they announce that there's an armada steaming towards, you know, North Korea, and it turns out it's really heading to Australia, you know, right? 
always correcting them on it and they're not apologizing for saying that right. and it's kind of hard to figure out but one thing people should be aware of is we do have a lot of immigration laws and to deport somebody you have to follow them you can't just walk up to somebody and say you know i think you should leave the country i'm deporting you immediately you know mm -hmm. we're going to grab you and deport you mm -hmm. um, there's due process rights that people have so people often have a right to a hearing with the judge they have a right to an attorney if they can afford one um, immigration proceedings though are civil proceedings they're not criminal so people don't have a right to a free attorney because they're not being charged with a crime okay uh, and they have uh, less due process rights than they would have in a criminal court proceeding mm -hmm. so uh, one thing to do is educate yourself on what your rights are and I did bring along for everyone um, a know your rights great um, pamphlet so that talks about that what out. people's rights are okay. uh, when a lot of people aren't aware of their rights so the most important thing is figure out what your rights are so you can assert them mm -hmm. uh, and then hold public officials to account yeah. you know uh, if you see something say something <laughs> you know the TSA likes to tell you you know, if you see something, say something. Well, if you see something, would, say, something right, well. say something as well out there in the world, you know, of immigration. Um, there are things that public officials are doing that are against the law, you know, and people need to speak up and write your public officials. I think that's really important. You have two senators, you have a congressman, you have a governor, and the president. You can write to the president and tell him what you think should be his position on different issues. If you think he's doing something that you don't agree with, write him a letter and tell him. You know, Barbara, on that topic of regarding our representation, for is there any one way, one method of communication to reach out to them that's more effective than the other? I realize you can write a letter, you can write an email, you could call their office in Alaska or in D.C. Um, sometimes there's public testimony. There's um, I don't think we do a lot of town halls here. Uh, at least I read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John was very interested in um, doing one in Fairbanks recently with that crowd. Um, is, is one method considered kind of a bit more effective than the other, or? I think the most effective method is to go meet with them, one-on-one. Okay. -on -one. And you're a constituent, if you're a voter, you have perfect right to call up Lisa Murkowski, Dan Sullivan, Don Young, and ask to meet with them. Right. And if you're in Washington, they have hours available where you can meet with your elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, you can also go with a group of friends, you know, say you'd like mm -hmm. to have a meeting with the congressman to talk about a particular issue. Um, if they refuse to make an appointment with you, you can certainly camp outside their office <laughs> and intercept them when they come into the work in the morning or yep. you know, when they leave for the day, walk down the hall. Um, I've done this in Washington, D.C. I've spent a lot of time in Washington mm -hmm. working on different issues. And if you see a senator in the hallway, there's nothing stopping you from walking up and saying, hey, senator, I want to talk to you while you're on your way to the chambers to vote on an issue. I want to talk to you about a particular issue. Let's let's walk and talk. Yeah, have nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, you can go to events that they announce. They have had public events. There were several of them over the weekend mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. Down on the Kenai, I know Senator Sullivan and Senator Murkowski mm -hmm. were down there this weekend on Saturday. You could show up at the public events that they're at and talk to them there. Um, get in line, ask a question. Mm -hmm. So I think personal contact is the best thing if you can do that. And following that, telephone calls to their office. You might not actually get to talk to a senator or a congressman when you call their office, but you'll certainly get to talk to a staffer who will relay the information. And it's an absolutely wonderful thing to do to call up and say, I'm so-and-so, I'm a voter in Alaska, I live in Anchorage, Fairbanks, whatever, and this is my view of a particular issue. I hope you'll take that into consideration when you're voting on this issue. Uh, phone calls are great. Uh, letters are great. They're old-fashioned. And they should be form letters. You know, try to personalize them as much as possible. But they assume for every letter they get, there's a, another hundred people out there that feel the same way you do, and just haven't gotten around to writing a letter. So I think letter writing is really a good idea. This group could organize a letter writing evening or letter writing mm -hmm. day, and mm -hmm. everybody could get together and write their own letter and post it. Um, emails are fine. Uh, the only thing I've noticed with emails is they get so many of them yeah. that they have canned responses to yeah. emails. And you get the canned response back so fast that you know they did not right. spend much time reading your email. I don't think it hurts to send emails. Okay. And there's also faxes. If you want to drive them crazy, send them a fax. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's yeah. what we should consider that. Yeah. Consider that. Yeah. Faxes, emails. Well. You know, and then the other old-fashioned things you can do are letters to the editor. Uh, oh, they do course. read the dispatch, and people can write letters to the editor that will be in the dispatch. And I've often seen elected representatives cut out the letters that they see 
kind of paper, you know, they get reports on what's been in the paper. Um, mention your elected officials when you write a letter to the editor and they will probably see it because their staffer will pull the news feed from the dispatch that mentions their name and say, hey, this is what the constituents are saying about you. And other people get to see what you wrote when you wrote a letter to the editor. And it's forever. It'll be on the online as well as in the print edition. So that's a great thing. It's very helpful for all of us. I think we want, we want to spread the word amongst our membership and, and, and just friends of our membership uh, on what we can do and just remind everybody that there are tools out there and that it's um, perfectly okay and encouraged to, to get out there and make your voice heard. And there's some more modern things that you might also consider like Facebook. Every politician has a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and post. Mm -hmm. Share things. Um, you know, all these new <laughs> kinds of social media, Tumblr, Twitter, mm -hmm. Mastodon, I guess, is the new Twitter <laughs> version. You know. Hard to keep up with all. Yeah, yeah. but you know, keep up with it. Check it out. Yeah. It can be a lot of fun. You can even yeah. buy apps now that will allow you to post to six or seven different social media. All at once. All at once. I mean, wow. Just kind of yeah. spread it out there. You can spread it right, out. Right, right, right. Um, you know, um, thinking about um, our membership and, and, and the group associated with us, um, you had mentioned earlier about how you are seeing more and more um, mm -hmm. immigrants and people just leave, going, the, right. going the other way. Right. Trying to keep this as broad for the nation. I think that there's, so there's a bit of um, passing pessimism maybe more than usual lately and um, people being discouraged could you just talk to us a little bit about your your views and um, the hope that you see or not um, you know we're, we're we're not even in our first full year yet of um, at least four years most likely of, of this administration um, are you optimistic about um, well, things turning around or? yeah I am optimistic and I think it's because I'm a student of history and I've seen America go through times like this before we've been doing this kind of cyclical thing since 1775 yeah. um, you know we had our different periods where we were afraid of different immigrant groups you know the Irish were considered a terrible scourge on America in the early 1800s you know, I remember reading some old army documents where all the army officers were talking about the scary Irish immigrants all joining the military and how they were a threat to national security. I mean, they didn't use it, those terms in the early 1800s, but they were all speaking Gaelic. <laughs> they weren't integrating into American society. You know, people with the name Sullivan, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, um, and so we've gone through these times, and I, I think we're, and of course this group knows, you know, we had the terrible periods in the late 1800s, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and, you know, the Japanese Exclusion Act, and so different groups have been targeted mm -hmm. at different times, even the Germans, you know, Mr. Trump doesn't apparently know the history of his own family, but in the World War One era, we were absolutely terrified of German Americans. And they even outlawed speaking German in Nebraska, there was a case that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court very, very famous case, Meyer versus Nebraska, where mm -hmm. a parent was trying to teach German to their child, and it was illegal in Nebraska to teach German. And it was all because World War One we had fought the Germans, and so you were considered unreliable if you were German, you know. Um, and um, our current president's ancestors were in the mm -hmm. country at that time, so, you know, it's kind of ironic to me. Um, but we had these things, you know, we were targeting Germans, and um, certainly that reared its ugly head again, you know, yeah. when we fought in World War One, uh, World War Two. of course we had anti-Japanese sentiment and mm -hmm. Japanese Americans weren't treated very well by our government because people were afraid due to the fact that we were at a war. So I think we've seen this happen again and again in American right. history, but the important thing is to educate people about how we've done this in the past, it doesn't turn out well when you target groups, yeah. America is a nation of immigrants, people are individuals. You know, you can't just categorize a whole group of people as being disloyal, and that, that's mm -hmm. not accurate. And it doesn't help our national security because if you are in a conflict with a hostile foreign group, you will want people who speak that language on your side to help you understand what, you know, the people you're fighting about, fighting with are saying, what their culture is, you know, you need that cultural understanding in order to win the conflict mm -hmm. and bring it to an end. Um, and if you don't have that, you're never going to, prevail in, in your conflict. So um, cultural understanding is really critical in the modern global conflict. We just make it worse if we don't uh, understand what we're fighting about and who we're fighting and mm -hmm. what their views are on things. If we can't understand the language, we're certainly not going to be able to defend ourselves. This must be a very interesting time to be a, um, a high school or junior high civics teacher. 
um, history teacher, and in university as well, um, just about what's going on. I can only imagine. Well, I think it's tough, and that's one of the things, one of the places where our education system seems to be failing us. We're not teaching our young people to be critical thinkers. Um, that's a big gap. There's a report that just came out about democracy teaching in the schools and teaching people not to succumb to demagoguery, um, teaching people about how, what it is to be a good citizen, that you have to consider facts. You know, you should consider science. You know, we just had the parties yes. <laughs> yesterday. No. Um, you know, the fact that people are questioning science for political reasons right. should be alarming to people who yeah. believe in democracy because you have to have an engaged, educated public that understands the dangers of demagoguery. Um, presidential democracies have been brought down by demagogues in the past. Not our presidential democracy, but mm -hmm. other countries have. Yeah. And we need to educate people about that, because there's no reason why we're so special that we can't have our democracy sure. undermined by a lack of an educated citizenry. Yeah. So teachers are really critical in the schools. I mean, mm -hmm. they, it's great they're teaching math and science, but they also need to, need to be teaching civics yeah. and history. Yeah, very, very, very true. And we do have some educators in our membership as well, so I would like, I would think that they do agree with that, and we'll, we'll I'll hope for uh, for some change there. Maybe lastly, Margaret, um, before we go into a little bit of Q and A with our with our group today, um, so we have some members within JAA and um, with the JACL that um, are moving back uh, to their home countries, particularly Japan, or considering the idea. And, and healthcare seems to be at the root of that. Now, that isn't necessarily an issue that's just um, kind of, um, you know, just for that group. I mean, that the entire country is, is really an issue for everybody. going through that. But um, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what are the, the chances of, um, of, of really having some maybe radical or, or significant change in our, in our system? I mean, what's, what's preventing people from being a bit more open-minded about a government-run health care? Well, all of us have been to other countries that have had it, in, um, and we, it, it seems to be working fine. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, again, we need to educate the citizenry. And I think the most disturbing thing about the health care system is it doesn't seem to be run for the purpose of providing health care. It seems to be run for the purpose of providing profit to the healthcare industry. <laughs> and that's not the point of a healthcare system. And it's kind of like if you had an education system that was being run to maximize teacher salaries or something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or the textbook profits of the textbook companies or something, mm -hmm, you wouldn't mm -hmm. get a good product. You know, the idea should be, the vision, the mission should be to educate the people within the system, yeah. the children who are supposed to be getting an education. And that should be your benchmark. And our benchmarks aren't, are we providing the best health care possible at the lowest price to our citizens? In fact, it's, it's horrifying when you look at the numbers. You know, we have the most expensive health care in the world, and we're not providing good health care to yeah. our citizens. And that should be the basic benchmark. For, you know, it's a public good. Health care is a public good. Yeah. Uh, and people don't seem to realize that. So I think until we have a community that's willing to talk openly about the fact that our philosophy is all wrong, yeah. we're not going to get the system fixed. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of powerful interests involved in this that, that make it hard to change um, whenever you have this kind of money involved you do. as well. It, yeah. It's not going to be easy to um, swing things quickly. Right. And you probably saw an example, so if you read the paper the other day about the dentist who's facing yes. criminal charges. Or Medicaid fraud. And, right. right. Yeah. I mean, there's an example of somebody, I mean, a dentist should have a mission of providing dental care to patients. I mean, his mission shouldn't be to maximize the amount of money he can get without any concern for the well-being of his patients. Yeah. So we've gone astray when yeah. our healthcare providers think about money more than the welfare of their patients. And I think we have to get back That's true. to that fundamental true. philosophical issue and start talking about it openly. Um, for, uh, I think at this time, it'd be a good chance to open up any um, questions from our audience? Does, does anybody have anything uh, in particular that they would like to ask Margaret? We have a great opportunity here with her I, now. I do. So, um, I'm part of a group where people are re-entering either society or another culture. And we're trying to put together a program where we can provide cultural translators. Because so often people get themselves in a jam by tending to agree with what they don't really understand or being taken advantage of. Uh, by, as you pointed out, somebody telling them something that they, they really don't have the right to do. Have you seen that used in this 
the system dealing with immigration? Not attorney, like representatives do. Have you seen anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I can think of a lot of examples of that, though. Is there one particular issue that you've seen? That no, I just want to know if there was an existing program that we could steal blatantly from and borrow and, and uh, use for our system. Oh, for, as far as healthcare goes? No, or, no these, these are people re-entering society and oftentimes they're dealing with the legal system and don't understand the options or, don't, or, or will admit to things just because culturally they've been taught to respect right. authority uh, and, and get themselves in a jam that they really shouldn't be at. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Ironically, I saw Americans having that problem in Japan mm -hmm. uh, when I was over there. Um, those of you who come from a Japanese background will probably understand that Japanese police have quite different methods than American police and the um, culture. Nation. Well, and the society um, has a completely different view of, for example, if a police officer asks you questions, whether you should cooperate and answer the questions or not. Mm -hmm. And in America, the typical American, if a police officer confronts them, they'll say, I'm going to get a lawyer, I'm not going to talk to you. Yeah. And in Japan, people are more likely to confess, to want to come forward and confess mm -hmm. something and tell the police what happened. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's a big cultural difference. And when I was in Japan, I saw Americans would do something and the Japanese police would ask them a question and they would be very hostile and they would- Yeah, kind of defensive, of course. I'm a lawyer, I'm not talking to you. And of course, to the Japanese police, that, that meant you're a criminal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you must be a diehard, unrepentant criminal and we're going to throw the book at you because yeah. you're immediately getting a lawyer and refusing to yeah, talk you're to you. You're being people. difficult. <laughs> Basically, you know, but it, I mean, I saw that happen and they, you know, they would get worse treatment because they didn't understand the culture Yeah. and that you were supposed to be cooperative and you're supposed to come forward and talk and, mm -hmm. and be polite mm -hmm. to the police and not, you know, be hostile and that sort of thing. And we have a very, very different legal culture in America. Um, so, I think that happens a lot, and um, I've noticed also with language issues. Uh, we have a way of talking in America that in English. Um, the typical example is a negative question. Those of you who study Japanese will understand this immediately. Um, law enforcement will ask a question that's either got a yes or no answer to them, and they'll tell you to you can only say yes or no in answer to this question, but they'll ask a negative question like didn't you go to the store last night? And that gets translated as, you did not go to the store last night. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. are you supposed to say yes or no to that? Mm -hmm. And it's actually the opposite answer in English that you would give in Japanese. Yeah. Um, same with Alaska Native languages. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get completely wrong information when you're asking somebody a question in court or interrogating them, you get the opposite answer from what you think you're getting because they're, the linguistics is different. Um, and I've noticed that kind of thing, you know, just from studying Japanese. I mean, you, you answered a negative question in Japanese the opposite way you would answer it yeah. in English. So you get the wrong answer if you're interrogating somebody. Thank you. And so you have to have people that understand that that's going on, and particularly interpreters, and you have to clarify, wait a minute, when you said you did not go to the store, were you agreeing with the statement, I did not go to the store? Or you were you yeah, saying that you went yeah. to the store, you know? Because we definitely yeah. see that both a combination of language and culture that, that, that gets that. And that's what we were talking about putting program together for these translators that would hopefully have both, but definitely the cultural piece. Thank you. No, I think it's really important to do that. And of course, if you're from Japan, you know what people say. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, very, very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a great holder. Uh, I have been here uh, for 37th year this year. And I'm thinking to switch the way I mean, the citizenship all the time now because uh, I have a, a language body to the English and, and I'm original Japanese and also culture. So it's very hard to switch to America. It is. So uh, myself, uh, uh, I'm a Japanese. It's very hard. 
So, mm -hmm. so I, I myself, uh, I myself am disqualified to the American. So, but a uh, couple years ago, my friend who lived in the Portland, Oregon, <coughs> she switched to uh, citizenship because uh, she warned me uh, in the future, in uh, United States may cut a uh, green card benefit, a uh, green card holders uh, benefit, uh, same as U.S. citizenship, Medicare card, uh, mm -hmm. social security card, it's possible. So she suggested to me, so you need to switch to still. So that's my... So it sounds like she was worried that, yeah. um, that all the things that um, she has a right to access could they possibly just be taken away, right? Right, and that's a concern. Um, oh, and yes. that's the reason why a lot of people are applying for citizenship. Now, one thing that often holds people back is um, the United States recognizes dual citizenship. So if a person becomes an American citizen, mm -hmm. they can keep their old citizenship in their former country if the former country lets them. Okay. But that's a matter of the former country's law, not American law. And so if Japan would allow people to keep Japanese citizenship when they became American, then probably a lot more people would naturalize and they would end up with two passports. Mm -hmm. um, it's very common for people to be dual citizens. There's a lot of countries that allow people to keep their citizenship. Actually, they just don't allow you to give it up. Um, yeah. Like Canada doesn't, doesn't recognize American citizenship. If you naturalize as an American, you, you don't expatriate yourself as far as the Canadians are concerned. They don't recognize an American naturalization is divesting you of Canadian citizenship. I believe the Philippines allows um, to have two. Well, lots of countries do. Um, the, the big example is the Queen of England doesn't allow you to give up allegiance to the Queen. If you want, but you're still one of my subjects. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so there's a lot of countries that have a lot, are starting to allow dual citizenship more right. so than in the past. The Germans recently changed the rules, so if you apply to keep your German citizenship before you become an American, you end up as a dual. Mexico okay. also changed its rules. Um, right now, as I understand it, the Japanese don't allow you to keep it, but they might change that rule in the future. And certainly, if you're Japanese, you could ask your government to allow you to sure. you know, keep it. Um, it certainly got some advantages. One of the reasons the Mexican government changed it was they determined that it was better for people's loyalty to Mexico to allow them to keep Mexican citizenship yeah. and just maintain both citizenships. Mm -hmm. um, what that means though is you have to have two passports and you got to, when you travel internationally, you carry both. both you enter right. the U.S. with your American um, and you would enter the other country with your foreign country mm -hmm. passport. Um, but the U.S. doesn't allow dual citizenship, so that's something to keep in mind if if you're um, from a country that will allow you to retain it. Um, also, it's uh, if you've had a green card for a really long time, the test is easier. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, it's not just the one right. size you know, all test for no, everybody. They give you benefits if you've had a green card for a really long time. Okay. Um, how, how long? Um, the first benefit kicks in at 15 years of having mm -hmm. had a green card, and then they step up the benefits. Okay. And it also depends on your age. Mm -hmm. um, and I know everyone in this room is really young, but um, <laughs> benefits for people who are over 50, basically, you know, that step up. And then there's even, at one point, you don't even have to speak English anymore if you're old enough and you've had your green card. And you've been here for, uh, right. you basically you're getting credit for the, long, the longer you've been. Um, you also don't have to speak English perfectly to become an American citizen. You just have to speak simple English. And if you are understanding me today, you can pass the citizenship test. <laughs> okay. okay. So okay. encouraging. So, you know, for anyone yeah, that's made and on the fence. Right. No, so it's, I'm disappointed I cannot vote. So ah. that uh, I mean, yes. uh, I wanted you vote in the last time election. Well, that's a big advantage. So <laughs> there's, there's <laughs> other advantages. A couple of the things you should just be aware of. If you become a citizen, they can't deport you. Uh, you can vote. You can run for public office. You get tax advantages 
if you're married to an American citizen. And this is something just to mention, if you're if you're a green card holder, you're married to an American citizen, you don't get the full estate planning benefits yep. that two American citizens get. Mm -hmm. So your estate planning is really pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're an American citizen and you move overseas, you keep your American citizenship, even if you're gone for a really long time. If you're a green card holder and you go back to, say, Japan for a year, you can lose your green card. You might have to reapply all over again from the beginning. And that can be really, yes. really, really tough. Uh, something to consider. Um, green card holders have to maintain their residence in the United States. They have to primarily live in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so if a green card holder's gone for too long, a green card holder can lose green card, a green card. But what, uh, how, how many years, for example? How many years? Uh, you can't be gone for more than a year with a green card. Okay. One year. One year. Yeah, your green card's no good to get, get you back into the U.S. after one year. Now, you can apply for something called a re-entry permit if you think you're going to be gone for more than a year, but that's only good for two years. So, so if you are... A, it's a question of where do you want to bury your permit? <coughs> <laughs> we don't need to worry about that yet. <laughs> 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 it's worth it. Right. But if you're a green card holder and you're thinking about leaving the U.S. for a really long time, you should talk to a lawyer mm -hmm. before you go. Yeah. Because you can run into trouble. Not to mention that this would throw a wrench into your PFD. <laughs> 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 I think we're going to leave some. Yeah. A green card holder should also be really careful not to accidentally register to vote because that's a deportable oh. offense. Oh. Um, and the government's oh. been yeah. deporting lots of people who accidentally got signed up to register to vote. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So um, okay. the, the DMV is notorious for registering people to vote by accident because they have motor voter. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. go in to get their driver's well, license and they accidentally get registered. And yep. um, the immigration lawyers in Alaska are actually concerned about the automatic PFD voter ah, registration. That's right. That's that because that very well could happen to a lot of people. Yeah, it's a deportable so. offense for a green card holder to register to vote, to vote, or to claim to be a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you check the box wrong on the yeah on the on the application, application or say you're a citizen. Yeah, and you were kind of mentioning um, initiatives and things. Um, one of the Banes of immigration lawyers are the folks who registered people to vote in front of buildings. Oh, uh, with the, the clipboard yeah, and um, green people. They, and they have registered green people green who are green card holders. Okay. Yes. Inadvertently. Yeah. Um, and I've run into cultural problems where folks are new to the United States, they're here legally, and they're, they're told that it's their duty to register to vote oh. by yeah. well meaning voter registration people. Sure. Um, I ran into a military wife who registered to vote. She was a green card holder, and her professor at a community college told her that it was her duty to register to vote. Mm -hmm. She had a green card. So she oh, registered to vote because the professor told her to do this. Yes. Um, well, to be a good student, good right. citizen, a good resident. Right. And I guess the professor didn't occur to the professor she wasn't an American citizen, so she wasn't allowed to vote. Yeah. And jury duty. Um, mm -hmm. You are missing out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's right. Um, a, a, um, a, 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 we've seen the rise of a uh, series of uh, uh, asylum cities. Sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities, right? Yeah. Yeah. San Francisco, Seattle. Like, I, I doubt Alaska would adopt being a sanctuary city, but what can they do You know, f uh, you know, against this uh, the big regime, right? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, as far as I can tell, there's no definition in federal law of a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a myth that's grown up that there are these cities that somehow are not complying with federal law or something or other, and they're, you know, I don't know, they're hiding people out or whatever they're doing. Um, there's actually no federal definition of a sanctuary city. Anchorage has been accused of being one in the past. We had an assembly member who ran, lost. Um, years ago who was claiming that Anchorage was a sanctuary city. Um, it's a complicated issue because federal immigration law requires the police to do certain things, uh, that requires immigration officials to do certain things that require cooperation with the local police. But they're both, it's not just getting people deported, it's also providing benefits. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's a federal law that provides crime victims with a visa, but only if they cooperate with the police. Mm -hmm. So the crime victim has to cooperate with the police, and then the crime victim can get a special kind of visa because yeah. the person's a crime victim and they cooperated with the police. And we've had that visa used in Anchorage, and we've had some shootings where an immigrant got shot by some bad person who mm -hmm. was doing bad things, and the immigrant cooperated with the police and got a special visa. 
Um, sanctuary cities supposedly are cities that don't cooperate with the federal government on immigration issues, but it's, it's really a misnomer because they they do cooperate. They just maybe don't cooperate in the way that some people want them to cooperate. Mm -hmm. They cooperate, mm -hmm. don't cooperate to get everybody deported right. because the police department thinks it's better to have the cooperation of the immigration sure. community, yeah. the immigrant community, rather than blindly deporting everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I see a lot of cases where immigrants are being abused by American citizens who brought them here. Mm -hmm. So an American citizen will bring an immigrant over, and I don't want to blame men because women do this too, but typically it's a man mm -hmm. who brings a woman to Alaska, and then he won't file the papers for her because she won't do what he told her. Mm -hmm. So she would refuse to cook dinner the way he wanted it, or she argued with him about something or whatever. So he says, I'm not filing your immigration papers because yeah. you won't do what I want kind of thing. And so there's abuse going on in the relationship, and the, he's using the immigration status sure. and it's the right. power yeah. to or, or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and so what I often hear from people is, I'm going to have you deported if you don't do what I say kind of thing. Well, do you want the local police to be helping the guy that won't file the papers for his wife and so she's illegally here because he won't file the papers for her, and he's yeah. using that as a power tool in the relationship. Oftentimes, there's physical abuse going on too. Yeah. You know, I'm going to punch you, but you can't tell anybody because I'm going to have you deported yeah. if you report this to the police. There's a lot of that that goes on in Alaska, okay. and it's not just men either. I mean, I have a, a woman called me up the other day and wanted her husband deported. To have her husband deported, you know, because she's upset with him. Or about something. Yep. Right. Um, and so the police in a, a well-functioning community have to be really careful how they sure. respond to this sort of thing. If they're going to blindly arrest every immigrant who's out of status and then deport them and cooperate with the feds in deporting them, they may actually be assisting abusers right. you know, who are trying to do bad things to people, or they might be assisting human traffickers inadvertently, you know, that sort of thing. It's really a fine line. It puts the well, local... situations are really complicated. Sure. Here. Um, so the, it's a misnomer to call it a sanctuary city. I mean, I think what the, the jurisdictions that are, are called sanctuary cities tend to be ones that are more sophisticated in their law enforcement. They try to do community policing, and they're trying to figure out, you know, they want to cooperate with the feds if they have a super bad guy who's an, or a woman who is an immigrant yeah. because they don't want that person in their community, but at the same time they don't want to be deporting abused victims. Um, and so it's a really pretty complicated issue one that requires a pretty deep discussion to understand fully. Uh, there's also a lot of liability involved, and so some of these places that are called sanctuary cities have gotten burned by the feds. It may surprise you to know this, but the federal government doesn't have a database of citizens. Hmm. They can't tell. They don't. There's no single right. database that tells them who's an American citizen and who's not. So they go by things like, what do you look like? Where were you born? Yeah. Okay, well, where you're born doesn't tell you whether somebody's a citizen or not. And so, and they often get wrong information. You know, the federal government's databases are, are terribly flawed. Um, and so there have been a number of notable cases, and we've had some in Anchorage, where the feds have fingered somebody and said that they're not a citizen and they want them deported, and it turns out the person's a citizen. There's a horrible article, if you like reading horror story articles in the New Yorker, called The Deportation Game. And it's about a young man who was born in America, but he was of Hispanic heritage, and he was mentally um, ill. And somehow the immigration agents convinced him that he was from Mexico and got him to sign papers saying that he was from Mexico, and they deported him to Mexico, even though he was a native-born American who did speak Spanish, by the way. And they deported this guy to Mexico. He ended up, he's mentally ill. He ended up wandering around Central America. The Mexicans kicked him out because he wasn't Mexican. And he ended up wandering around Central America. He finally got into a U.S. consulate in Central America where a consular officer felt pity for him, realized he was an American citizen, gave him a temporary passport, put him on a plane. He flew back into Atlanta airport, and the Atlanta airport customs and border protection agent said, hey, you're a Mexican guy that we just deported. Yeah. We're going to deport you again. Oh. oh. Okay. So he was sort of caught up in this trap. Yes. Yeah. Where the feds had fingered him as being a Mexican guy, and his fingerprints were tied to this Mexican name, and they claimed he was Mexican. And he ended up, the ACLU represented him, and they got him some damages and everything, but 
he went through this horrible experience that is not unique. I mean, there's just a, they actually arrest and try to deport lots of American citizens. I mean, I've had those cases in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is a terrible experience. But yes. what about his family? Or? Well, his family was fighting with the government because his brother was actually in the army, mm -hmm. and he, he disappeared. Mm -hmm. And the family was like, well, where did he go? And it turned out he'd been deported to Mexico. They didn't know. And they couldn't find him. Oh. You know, I mean, we're talking about a young man who's not all yeah. there, you know, and he got coerced into signing papers saying that he was Mexican with a fake name by a federal agent, you know, and then they deported him to Mexico. And then we've, we've had a, a fair number of those cases. Yeah. We also yeah. lots of people who get wrongly identified as being non-citizens who get arrested by immigration and they get put in jail. And you know, we've had a few of them in Anchorage. I had a case years ago, I got damages from the young man. He was um, born in a foreign country, but he was a U.S. citizen. And he um, went in to get file the paperwork to get his U.S. citizenship certificate because he had derived citizenship through his mother mm -hmm. and his mother was an American citizen and he derived it through her. But he happened to be born in a foreign country in Europe. And he went in to do the papers and the day he went in there was a really long line in immigration. Okay, So he was going in there and they told him you got to pick up an N-600 form. Mm -hmm. So he, um, he had actually applied for citizenship with the wrong form and they denied the application for citizenship because he filed the wrong form, mm -hmm. filed an N-400 instead of an N-600. So they told him, go get an N-600 and file that because you filed the wrong okay. form. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he went to immigration and the line's really long and he got tired of waiting. So he never picks up the N-600 form and he never files it, right? Mm -hmm. So years later, they arrested him for something and they turned him over at immigration to deport him. And the immigration agent, the file was apparently really thick. So mm -hmm. the immigration agent didn't bother to read the file. And in the file, there was a note saying, this guy is a citizen, needs to file an N-600. So if they had read the file, they would have realized this guy is an American. Well, they put him in jail, they had him in jail, they threatened him with deportation, and he was a U.S. citizen. So I ended up filing a lawsuit against the government under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Mm -hmm. And they paid damages to the guy because in the file, it said, this guy is a U.S. citizen. They just had to bother to read the file. So that kind of thing goes on all the time. Yep. Um, Anchorage has had a fair number of those cases. We've had a couple in the last couple of weeks where immigration thought somebody was a deportable alien. And the municipalities that cooperate with the government mm -hmm. in arresting and deporting a U.S. citizen end up having to pay damages. Uh -huh. So that's another reason why they, they yep. don't want to cooperate with the feds because there is no foolproof database. When the feds identify somebody and say, this person's a foreigner, hold them. There's liability for the police sure. department. So a lot of police department holds that person, and they turn out not to be a foreigner. Wow. Yeah. So, what is a deportation process like? If, so, I mean, and how fast? You know, if somebody arrested me saying we're going to deport you, how fast would that happen? Or, or you just picked up somebody buys you a plane ticket and sends you back to your country of origin? How kind of what's? That's a great question. It's complicated. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and it depends on the person. Okay, so I'll give you one example. If you are a European or Japanese and you came over on the what they call the visa waiver program, mm -hmm. or ESTA, where you log on the computer and you get permission to come to America ahead of time and you come mm -hmm. for 90 days, the fine print in the agreement you signed electronically mm -hmm. or that you agreed to on the airplane when you're flying over says you give up all your rights if you stay past 90 days, and you can basically be immediately deported if you stay past 90 days. Okay, so somebody who comes in on that program and who stays past 90 days is not going to get a hearing with an immigration judge if they stay past the 90 days. They can just be immediately arrested and deported. Now, as a practical matter, nothing is immediate with the federal government. So somebody in Alaska who overstays their 90-day period of admission, if immigration finds them, they will arrest them, handcuffs, take them down to the immigration building, on the Michael Building, 620 East 10th Avenue. Um, they will process a whole bunch of paperwork, and then they'll actually put them on a plane and send them to Seattle to a detention center until they get the paperwork from their home country to physically deport them back to the home country. And this could take maybe a couple of days to several months wow. um, before they actually get put on a plane and sent back to their home country. Um, sometimes the immigration agents will let them go voluntarily, which basically means they buy their own plane ticket, but they're escorted to the airport and put on a plane, yep. go back to their home country, and that sort of thing happens. So 
if if you're one of those people, you, you think you're going to get deported immediately, but immediately might be a couple of months. And you'll be in a jumpsuit, in a jail, you know, while you're waiting for that process to happen. Um, other people who have a green card or who admit, admitted legally to the U.S. on a visa and have been here a long time, more than two years, might have a chance to go in front of a judge. Okay. Um, and then that process can take a while, like you said. It can take a long time. Yep. So what they typically do is they arrest the person, they send them to Seattle, the Northwest Detention Center. Um, the person asks for a bond with the judge. If the judge sets a bond and they pay it, then they're released from detention, and then they fly back up to Alaska and they wait for their hearing. Okay. If they can't pay the bond, they stay in the detention center, and the judge has a hearing in the detention center. But that might not take, that might take three or four months before you get a hearing in the yeah. detention center. Some yeah. people are held in the detention center for a really long time before they get a hearing. Um, and so that can happen. Then if you appeal your case, you might be in the detention center longer, or you might eventually be able to pay the bond, and you might get out. Some immigration cases go on for years and years and yeah. years and years. Margaret, I can imagine that with um, that with ESTA in the 90 days, for example, that there are often cases where um, somebody's kind of pushing the 90 days, things happen, um, mistakes happen, um, they, they, they rearranged their ticket, or, or maybe they forgot, I, I, who knows, and they, they go into 93 days, 94 days, are they automatically picked out right away at the airport? I mean, is that like a deal stopper when well, people they, leave? Or? No, um, not necessarily. I mean, again, the government doesn't, have they, it's not like people walk around with a sign saying you know arrest me. Mm -hmm. um, so the government has limited resources. They try to target people who are visa overstays, but they might have a priority list that says, hey, we need to go after somebody who got arrested for a crime. Okay. So they might go after those folks. Um, we had a situation a couple of years ago with somebody who didn't have an attorney. Who was um, he was a German person who came over and he was married to an American citizen. They didn't have a lawyer. She had he had come over on S stuff, the ninety day thing. And he overstated. He thought because he was married to an American and she was in the process of filing papers for him that he was okay. Mm -hmm. But the paperwork's very really complicated. And she had filed part one of it, but she hadn't filed the important part two because they didn't have the money and it was expensive. Mm -hmm. And before she could file part two, they ran into him and they arrested him and deported him. And she was distraught. She was on the radio talking about how she didn't expect her husband to get deported, and if she'd only known, you know, she would have filed the papers faster, and so forth. But, you know, she didn't have the benefit of having a lawyer tell her, "Hey, you got to get these papers filed for your husband," and she only filed part of it, and that part wasn't enough to keep him in the country wow. legally. Okay. So that kind of thing happened. Sure. And the, okay. You know, he was held in detention center for a couple of weeks before they deported him back to Germany. And then once he's deported, it's harder for him to get back because he's got an actual deportation. Right, of course. There's a bar to coming back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we've had some cases like that. Uh, definitely complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah. complicated. Yeah. yeah. One federal judge once said, um, immigration law is like King Minos's labyrinth in ancient Crete. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah. And um, the president, unfortunately, doesn't seem to understand that. So he thinks he can just immediately a bunch of people and he can immediately yeah. build a wall and, you know. and I actually think that um, this um, the time of the state would be quite complete without asking you um, about the wall, the wall. Um, or the reality of it so uh, it, it appears Margaret that um, are we down to a week before um, uh, Congress needs to um, to come up with the, the, the budget <laughs> And, um, and that's going to be a big sticking point. Yeah, on. the president said he was I mean, going to get that wall going in the first 100 days. And uh, <laughs> apparently, well, first, there's not going to be a wall after all, or at least not the one he described. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a, a, a cheaper version. Um, maybe not even a wall, but like electronic surveillance and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, right. the, the reality, which I, apparently nobody mentioned to him before he became president, was you actually have to get Congress to appropriate money to buy things in America. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Congress yeah. controls the purse strings, not the president. Yeah. So the president can't just order something when there's no funding for it. And so Congress has been the sticky point. They don't want to spend all the money. And of course, sure. you understand, right? I mean, if you're Don Young and you're voting for health care for rural Alaska or a wall, yeah. all right. Priorities Texas here. and Mexico, uh, I don't see that happening, you know. I mean, yeah. He, yeah. he knows that people in Alaska would rather see the money go into rural Alaska healthcare than go into a wall in yeah. Texas, you know. That so 
somebody can probably get over with a trampoline. Someone sent me the, uh, the funny video that's going around about the guy on the trampoline that he jumps. Like, oh, how long will it take to fall? You know, bouncing the trampoline and being overheard. It's like that. What about the infamous tunnels? The tunnels, the tunnels are actually a they're a big problem. They're, they're, there's lots of these tunnels going up, and I mean, the human ingenuity is amazing. When people come to America because they want to live here. And there are jobs here, and their families are here, um, and they are very resourceful. And if your house is burning down in Central America, yep. you're just not going to stay there because somebody told you that you needed to stay there. So we're going to head someplace where it's safer. And our country has always been a place that people have been attracted to. I mean, probably many of your ancestors came here because they were fleeing something in another country. I know, I know mine. <laughs> I did. A couple hundred years ago, I had some ancestors who were fleeing persecution in their home country and they came to the United States seeking a better life and that that's been our tradition and it's our what made our country strong so we should be proud that people want to live here yeah. you know yep, certainly uh, I have yep, last question get yeah, back to green uh, <coughs> if I forgot the expiry uh, in, in our 10 years so we needed to renew right so I have a uh, report so because the visa expired I don't. Oh, if a green, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. If a green card expires, it doesn't mean that you get deported, and it doesn't mean you've actually lost your green card, your permanent residence. Okay. It means you can't travel internationally uh, because you don't have a green card that's valid. Uh, yeah. So they won't let you on a plane, and they won't let you back in the United States because your card expired. Mm -hmm. But if your card expires and you have a you had a ten year card that expired, you simply renew it. Mm -hmm. um, you it, can, it, uh, it might pass. Yes. Yes, it's kind of like if your passport expires. Oh, yeah. Doesn't mean you lost your American citizenship. Okay. Just means your passport's expired, so you can't go on any trips out of the country without no. getting a new one. Oh. Right now, there's a there's a caveat to that, which is conditional permanent residence. People that only got the two year green card, oh. yeah. they have to file for an extension of that card before it expires, or they have to get a waiver mm -hmm. and so forth. So if you have a two year green card and it's expired, you should go see an attorney to figure out how to get that extended. But if it's a 10-year card and it's expired, you simply file to renew it and they will. I had somebody come in to see me a couple weeks ago who their card expired seven years ago. Um, and, uh, it was the husband's card and the wife was really mad at him. <laughs> I guess it didn't occur to him he needed to, you know. Yeah. Um, so that she was going through some drawer and found his card and it was oh, nice. and, um, But he hadn't left the country and yeah, so, so therefore I didn't really come so out. Just file to renew it, and it's okay. not, you can just get a new one. There's no problem doing it. Okay, yeah. very, very good to know. Margaret, we very much appreciate you.